I'm Sean Fennessy. I'm Amanda Dobbin. And this is The Big Picture, a conversation show about the man, the myth, the legend, Brad Pitt, who is perhaps our greatest living movie star. Amanda, you and I are here to talk about the top five Brad Pitt performances. And there's a lot going on with Brad this year. I would, I would argue that Brad is winning 2019 right now. I'm with you. As long as we don't term it a comeback, because mm. you know what? Brad Pitt has always been with us as this podcast is going to explore. And I really resent uh, the younger members of The Ringer who are trying to put this as a comeback. It's just, it's another level of Brad Pitt, you know? We're what? on the journey with him. Why do you think that is? Because I feel like as we looked, as I look back on his films and his work, and you may have some extracurricular work in your list, mm -hmm. he is really consistently at least interesting and often good. And he's made a few bombs, a few stinkers in his career. But for the most part, he's, he's often in good movies and often a good celebrity in that way. So why would someone think that he needs a comeback? Well, he hasn't been in movies as much. He hasn't starred in two movies in the same year in a, like a decade probably. Mm -hmm. And he has with a couple notable exceptions, Allied, which I think we should we would all like to forget. We'll be skipping Allied yes. on this podcast. And War Machine, for the most part, for the last decade, he's been doing supporting roles in movies that he has produced. 12 Years a Slave, The Big Short. And he has been being the producer Plan B guy. And so as a leading man and a movie star, we don't see him as often as we used to. So that's a possibly part of it. Also, people are just used to having someone in their face 24-7. So if if someone takes some time away for themselves, apparently that means they need to come back. It's, it's infuriating to me. More power to them. Last week, we did an episode of tracking the career arc of Jennifer Lopez. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest. One of the challenges of that episode for me was not just talking about um, the fact that I think Jennifer Lopez is really hot. And that has a certain kind of charge to it. Sure. We did talk about that. We did. And that's okay because she is extremely beautiful and she uses that in her performances, as does Brad Pitt. That's why I bring it up because mm -hmm. I think that they, ha they share a self-knowledge of their attractiveness, of their energy against us in a lot of ways to 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 to, be, to have us bend the knee to them and tell me a little bit about when you first came across Brad the icon because I think a lot of people have signal moments with him where they 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 have been turned on by a a young movie star so what is your intro to Brad this is so weird and it's not on my top five, but my first Brad Pitt was definitely A River Runs Through It. Oh man. Because we read it in high school. Speaking of fathers and sons. And someone was like here watch this movie. And I was like, who is this unbelievably beautiful person? And also Brad Pitt is in his 20s in that movie. And I was like in middle school in that movie. So the age difference really works. He, I watched it again last night and I was like, wow, Brad Pitt looks really young. And this is a little spooky. But yeah, so I knew about Heartthrob Brad Pitt, which is kind of like early 90s. Obviously, Thelma and Louise, River Runs Through It, Legends of the Fall. And, you know, going back, I think obviously those movies use him well in that he is uh, like unbelievably attractive. And that is like a thesis of all those movies. But uh, as as performances are a little flat. Yeah, he hadn't quite figured out the essence of himself at that stage of things. And I feel like the the other performances, True Romance, California, that are happening around the same time, are a little bit closer to the person he's going to going to become. Mm -hmm. They're noisier and showier. River Runs Through It is one of the most placid, it's so boring. static. It's so boring. And it's such a riff on... Why did on, I have to read it in high school? I don't know. And and I think it's clearly Robert Redford identifying Brad Pitt as his heir mm -hmm. and wanting to put him in a position, but also making his movie slightly dull, almost maybe just to dull Brad Pitt's future in a way. Do and you he, like fishing? Um, I like the idea of right. being able to say, I'm a guy who likes to fish. At some point, you're just like sitting alongside a body of water waiting for a fish to bite something. It's uh, to me, it's all the same. Anyway, should we go into our top fives? Are you sure. ready? Are you ready to talk about what yeah. makes Brad Pitt such a special actor? Yes, I'd love to. Okay. So, for those of you who've never heard of Top Five Podcasts, it's very simple. We list five movies and we talk about why we like them in the event that one of us 
has a similar movie, but at a different space, will identify, oh, Amanda's number four is my number two. Mm -hmm. We're going to start, of course, at number five. What's your number five Brad Pitt performance? Burn After Reading. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right, we're already going there. I'm ready to have that conversation. It's not on my list. I, I went through, you know, the Stations of the Cross making this list, as I do every single time I do one of these. I know okay. it's boring to hear about at this point, but at first I was doing editor brain and being like, I will make a good list that is representative of a career and has like a clear idea and shows like Brad Pitt moving through time or whatever, which I sort of did. But at the end of the day, I was like, screw it. I'm just doing my favorites. I love Burn After Reading. I think a, a personal anecdote, much of it was filmed in the apartment building right next to where I lived in New York. Oh. So I have like personal affection for it. But I also think it it's Brad Pitt's like funniest, like ultra comedic performance. And I think we're going to talk a lot about like Brad Pitt being funny and his comedic timing. And there are different shades to that. But this is just kind of like, pure in on the joke humor. And that's what I like about it. It's also sometimes there is, I don't think anyone thinks Brad Pitt is dumb, but he has played some dumb characters. There are shades of Floyd from True Romance in it. There are shades of even the kind of airhead Thelma and Louise guy, but he is, he's not dumb. He's playing a dummy. And I, I respond to that. He plays a character named Chad Feldheimer. I'm not sure that there is a person <laughs> who looks less like a Chad Feldheimer than Brad Pitt. This, of course, is a Coen Brothers movie, and Brad Pitt is not the star of the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, George Clooney is sort of the star of the movie. Francis McDormand is sort of the star of the movie, but he is definitively a supporting actor. Yeah. And one of the things that people like to say about Brad Pitt has become a bit of a canard, but I think it is it has some truth in it. I know what you're about to say, and I'm going to revoke it after you say it, but okay. go ahead. It is that Brad Pitt is a character actor trapped in a movie star's body. Yeah. And... I think that that is something that maybe Brad Pitt has compelled us to say about him because of the way that he's managed his career, especially in the 21st century. In the in the 20th century, he was he was acting like a movie star. He was taking roles like Interview with the Vampire. In the 21st century, he has taken on a lot of parts that are supporting and odd and force him to uglify himself or make a fool of himself or remove some of the essential Brad Pittness that we know from the tabloids. Sort of. Revoke away. Well, number one, the reason that he can pull off any of those roles from basically 1999 on is because he's Brad Pitt and because he's a movie star and because he's selling stuff. I, you cannot divorce the movie star quality from any Brad Pitt performance, even in Burn After Reading. Like, part of the reason it works is because it is it is really handsome-ass Brad Pitt with terrible hair doing dorky dances that you can see he knows— that he is being ridiculous in this movie. And that and that is playing on the Brad Pittness of it all. My thing about the character actor trapped in a movie star's body is just like, that's fine, but it's based on the idea that anything he did in the 90s was like great. And I just think he was in the wrong roles for 10 years. They didn't know what to do with him. Or movies in the 90s and our idea of like a movie star movie didn't really fit Brad Pitt. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And there's probably a particular kind of run in the late 90s with movies like The Devil's Own, Seven Years in Tibet, Meet Joe Black, where he's taking on these sort of weighty, idea-laden dramas that didn't work and didn't allow him to really do anything interesting. And we got, and even though that, I mean, if you if you read the logline to Meet Joe Black, you'd be like, this movie is fucking weak as hell. <laughs> But it seemed very stodgy and it was very long. They're serious with serious. a capital S. Very much so. And once he broke out of that, and what happens after that is Fight Club and then Snatch and then um, Ocean's Eleven. And he starts making movies that have a different kind of energy and working with filmmakers that are not maybe taking themselves quite so seriously. And he's not taking himself quite so seriously. And you might say that Burn After Reading is sort of the apex of yes. that sensibility. Yeah. Uh, it's a very, very funny performance and a very, very funny movie. Is it like high in your Coen Brothers ranking? Yes as well. I mean, I, I couldn't give you a Coen Brothers thing off the top of my head. Okay. There are They are great filmmakers, but it's more, I just know the good ones and there's a vibe and... and Please respect the Coen Brothers. Yeah, We're I, moving just, on. Yeah. <laughs> I think that this is a very funny movie and I enjoy it. Uh, my number five is the movie called Seven. Okay. Um, I am a bit torn about talking about this because 
Seven is not the best David Fincher movie. It's not the best Brad Pitt performance in a David Fincher movie. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably safe to say that the work he does in Benjamin Button is a, a deeper and more complicated and more interesting role. But that role in Seven is one where I think a lot of guys like me met Brad Pitt for real. And two, I think it's the first time he was embarking upon like a kind of meta commentary about himself mm -hmm. where he's playing a hot shot detective who is slingshotted into this murder mystery case, the serial killer case with Morgan Freeman's older character. It's a very familiar shape to the movie. It's wizened, cranky guy. It's young guy who thinks he knows everything and is kicking the door down to make every move happen. But there's something kind of damaged to the character that he's playing that isn't necessarily on the page, but you can see, and it's obviously most not noticeable in the final sequence of the movie. For those of you who have not seen the movie Seven, shame on you. Also, you're weird. Uh, but when we learn that, of course, his wife's character has had her head chopped off and placed inside of a box, which is then delivered to the desert, which is the thing that happens at the end of this movie, Brad Pitt has a meltdown. And it's a meltdown that um, I think has kind of been memed over the years and is a bit ridiculous. And the what's in the box and the, you know, the, the gun pointed at Kevin Spacey's character, John Doe. But it is, it's a version of Brad Pitt that I like. It feels like maybe we're not watching the same actor, mm -hmm. but it is a guy that I enjoyed so much more than the River Runs Through It guy. Yeah. And it's also basically where I got a real sense of what David Fincher was going to be, who of course is a very important person to this podcast. And I like the idea of those two guys. I like the idea of Brad Pitt being the stand-in for Fincher's, the, the different phases of Fincher's life. Yeah. And vice versa, I, I think Brad Pitt discovers a lot of phases of his career with with Fincher because obviously Fight Club which is kind of when I think that's when it flips his career and he starts doing weirder stuff it's also when dickhead Brad Pitt comes out which I would like to talk more about do you um, have an opportunity to talk about that oh yeah okay. of course and and then and Benjamin Button is also in terms of him just doing weird stuff it, it you know, in a lot of ways, that's what we consider to be like old Oscar Bader. It's an adaptation of a, it's a Fitzgerald short story, right? Yes. And it is costumes and period drama. And, but it's also Brad Pitt is playing a person who de ages and looks like a weird old baby. For, he's playing an old baby. He's, he looks like One an the... old baby for 80% of the movie. That's such a weird thing to do with Brad Pitt. Yeah, I love Seven and I love Fight Club and I don't love Benjamin Button, but it let the record show that Brad Pitt has played an old baby, which is really just, <laughs> Can I just some say, of the greatest I, I transformational work. Mentions, and Benjamin Button is on there if only because sure. because it really, because he's playing an old baby, it's just Brad Pitt's face doing the work for the whole thing because yeah. it is CGI onto other things. Yeah. And it is kind of a testament just to the power of looking at Brad Pitt's face. Do we know if the stand-in baby was actually an old baby or was it just a regular baby? We don't know. <laughs> I think it was a regular baby. Okay, it was just a regular baby. What's your number four? My number four is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Okay, this is tied for number two okay. for me. Um, oh, you put them, okay. Yeah, You my, cheated? The thing is you have to cheat you on this what? show. I I took a stand. No, the, the this is a show that I work very hard on and I'm cheating and I'm doing what okay. I want. But so what? Once Upon a Time in Hollywood just came out. Yeah. It came out six weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I think it probably has not left our, our consciousness since then. But what can you say about it maybe that you have not yet said? Well, it was interesting to think about it in the cumulative terms of Brad Pitt's career, because to the point about using the identity of Brad Pitt and using movie starredness, this this movie is doing it like th that's the text as well as the subtext mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. But I think I was thinking a lot about about all the different things that make a Brad Pitt performance, and one thing that stands out for me is there's just like there's an easiness, which is not to say that. He can't be aggressive. He can't be really physical. He can't be a dickhead, as I mentioned. But it's a there's a confidence and a slightly reserved nature to the performances that I respond to. It's like a pace almost. And it, I think a lot of that comes with age. It's not something you can really do at 22 or 23. And the thing I like about Once Upon a Time is that it really is about it's the perfect role for Brad Pitt in 2019. It, it, it feels like a match of Ag actor and character. Agree. I think, as I've said many times on this show, that is the ultimate genius of Tarantino is knowing when to pluck mm -hmm. people from their 
stations of fame and place them in one of his movies and let them comment in real time on that fame. It's interesting in particular because Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, if I had to make a wager, I think this will be the movie for which Brad Pitt wins his Oscar. And if you look at the shape of that category at the moment and also just the fact that he's been so praised Mm -hmm. and even though he came forward and said that he will not be campaigning for an Oscar, that is the clear sign of a person who is going to be running for Oscar is making note of the fact that they're not participating. My man literally was on the Ellen show and did a segment where he sat in the audience for a full five minutes. The bit was just that like super fan Brad Pitt is in Ellen's audience and it's five minutes of him sitting in with all of the women. It's only women in the audience on Ellen like doing bits because he wants people to see Ad Astra, which obviously he has a financial responsibility to do as well as being the star. But And also the producer of the movie, which is a notable aspect of his his role in Hollywood now. Sure. But he's he's running. He's definitely running. Here can you name the three movies for which he was nominated? Moneyball. Yes. Um, That was for best actor. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, this is an interesting part of his persona, his identity is he's been nominated three times but you couldn't necessarily name when and where and why. And there was never really a feeling like he was going to win any of these Oscars. Was he nominated for Jesse James? He was not. Okay. I've lost now. The two other movies, one is Benjamin Button, which we've talked about here. Oh, yeah. For for Moneyball, he lost to... to, Well, I'll I'll, I'll save that tidbit. For Benjamin Button, he lost to Sean Penn for Milk. Okay. Which was Sean Penn's second Oscar, but is a a truly great performance and a transformation. And he was also nominated in for 12 Monkeys as Best Supporting Actor. Oh, really? Which is a movie that I suspect we're not going to be talking no. about on, on this episode. Though it is, it is a very good movie and it is a very interesting, I'm trying hard Brad Pitt performance <laughs> in which he plays, I think, the scion of a very wealthy man who kind of goes mad in the midst of the apocalypse. Um, he lost to Kevin Spacey in The Usual Suspects, mm. which okay. uh, is complicated. And for Moneyball, can you guess who he lost to? I thought... Oh, no, he didn't. Milk was Benjamin Button. Uh, Moneyball was 2011. One of the all-time travesties. Is this Jean Dujardin? It is. He he tap danced or whatever pretty nicely. I don't know. It's, Amanda, no. Okay. No. I, Under no circumstances. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Okay. I agree with you. I agree with you. Uh, we, we do not recognize the artist on this podcast. Um, my number four is Snatch. Okay. And I got to say, it's weird to me that I put seven and Snatch on this list. I was not expecting that. It's just like you're that. really, really putting your shoulder into to that phase of Brad Pitt. And and probably that phase of my life. But I, the thing I like about Pitt is that every time he does something that you're like, oh, you made Troy because you feel it's necessary to platform yourself as a handsome movie star, he then does something extremely strange right after that. Snatch is just a just a, just a weird movie. and. It's particularly weird what he's doing in the movie, which is essentially playing a British gypsy uh, <laughs> who is a bare knuckle boxer mm-hmm. who loves dogs yeah. or dags, as he says in the movie. I, His the accent work, I think, is credible. I don't know how to really fact check that. Okay, I just I I, I appreciate. <laughs> it seems like he invented it. So well, there's at least other family members in the in the okay. movie that that are speaking like him. Um, I think I just like the flex of it. I think it's just a ridiculous role. It's probably the most um, physically imposing he's ever been in a movie, even Mm -hmm. more so than Troy, maybe even more so than Fight Club. Um, It's an interesting riff on Brad Pitt, Golden God. It's somebody who is dirty and poor and fights a lot, and you can hardly understand him, Right. which is a move I appreciate. What's your number three? Ocean's Eleven. Great. Um, it, this is not on your list? Not on my list. Wow. I, I mean, this is Captain Obvious, but I think we were talking about Brad Pitt as a movie star. Here it is. We've talked a lot about the Once Upon a Time performance and how it is responsiveness in a lot of ways. Um, he doesn't have a lot to say. And you know what? He doesn't say a lot in Ocean's Eleven either. He just is is there being wry. And one of my favorite scenes is uh, Brad Pitt and George Clooney. You think we need one more? You think we need one more? All right, we'll need one more. And that shot is literally just Brad Pitt sitting on the bar. He doesn't move. He does nothing. And it's hilarious. There is, but there's just a a confidence and a control and a 
reservedness, which I was talking about, that he's he's not giving it all away, which makes you want more. Um, it also starts the Brad Pitt eating thing, which is one of my favorite gimmicks, uh, 20 years running. Yeah, I noticed it in a couple of movies I was rewatching yeah. last night, too. The one thing about Ocean's Eleven, and maybe this is the reason why I didn't put it on the list, is does the movie still work if he's not in the movie? I think it probably does. But it's not as cool. That's the other thing. It's, it's cool. kind of peak Brad Pitt as a as a cool person. And mm. that is an undercurrent of everything that he's doing, whether he's playing like a scrappy like outsider or whether he or a washed up person like Rick Dalton or whether he is playing someone like someone like Rusty or someone, you know, even a leading man. I think part of the thing with the 90s is that he was often a little too cool for the movies that he is in or it just doesn't fit. He was 37 years old when he made Ocean's Eleven, yeah. which is the age that I am right now. Okay. And I must say, I do not feel at all like Brad Pitt seems to feel in Ocean's Eleven. I want to say, I'm glad you don't have like the frosted tips that he has in that movie or whatever the hair situation. You think I should get into that? No, I really don't. And what it's about, What it's, about bleach blonde? It's amazing because he does often try to make himself less handsome. We were talking about this on jam session. He wears that hat to distract from the fact that the newsboy cap the newsboy cap which he has in like four colors I realized this week <laughs> and it's it's ridiculous but I think some of it is just kind of he knows the effect it, it, people who are that attractive know the effect that they have on someone and they use it in a lot of different ways and sometimes they and he often does try to hide it he is often doing weird haircuts or or movies where he's like really dirty all the time and you're just like what's happening or he's an old baby you know and even in Ocean's Eleven, he's wearing like gross Vegas stuff and he looks amazing. Yeah, I think his inability to actually be ugly even as an old baby is a testament to his all world handsomeness. I don't even know. I don't know. I don't even know how to comment on it. it this is a movie where he gets kind of close to somewhat ugly. But my number three is The Assassination of Jesse James by mm -hmm. the coward Robert Ford, which I think is a very interesting double feature with Ad Astra. And maybe a triple feature with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah. Three movies that seem to be obsessed with self-mythology and mythos and also fathers and sons. Mm -hmm. And why we believe the things about people that we think are heroes but are actually perhaps more flawed. And, you know, for those of you who haven't seen it, and a lot of people have not seen it because it's a historic bomb, um, it's, it's a retelling of the man, Robert Ford, who eventually killed Jesse James, but the first half of the film essentially tracks the James gang. And Pitt plays him as kind of a crotchety, kind of a dumb guy, kind mm -hmm. of a, kind of a, I don't know, an, an ill-fitting icon, somebody who is not exactly what we imagine them to be. And over time, we see the movie through Robert Ford's eyes and we learn how sour he becomes to the idea of idolizing somebody. And it's a super interesting movie to look at through the lens of what Pitt's trying to do to himself around this time. You know, um, your husband, Zach Barron, profiled Brad Pitt in, in GQ magazine. And there's an interesting conversation. Or there's a quote that he has in that piece from Dee Dee Garner, who is one of the folks who works at Plan B, Brad Pitt's production company. And she talked about making the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. And she reflected on the fact that it just didn't do well. Nobody, nobody really saw it, even though it was a very praised movie at the time. It didn't have an audience. It's probably one of the biggest losers in Brad's career. And Brad spoke to her and the, all the folks that work at that company and said, it doesn't matter. I'm so proud of what we've done here. These movies are going to stand the test of time. And that actually was true for Jesse James. That actually, It actually has emerged as, at least among a certain kind of cinephile bro, right. as a very beloved movie of the 21st century. And I feel like part of it is because he has very carefully managed his presentation and he knows when to make a movie at the right time in his career. And that's why we still, at 55 years old, we're still kind of reflecting on him in this way. It's really impressive. And there's not a lot of examples of it in the last 25 years in, in terms of movie stars. You know, like you and I love Tom Cruise mm -hmm. or, or Will Smith, two, two people that we really love. But I feel like those two guys have kind of embarrassed themselves a lot in the last 15 years. They've done a lot of things where I'm like, why did you do that? This was really bad. It's, it seems a little schlocky. I think of like Tom Cruise doing the Young Jock Dance at the BET Awards. And like, that's hilarious that that happened. 
but it's weird that, that I, I could never imagine Brad Pitt doing something like that. Mm-hmm. I could never imagine Brad Pitt being all over Instagram like Will Smith. Like he yeah. is a different kind of famous person. Yeah, there's a a social intelligence to it, I think, that comes across in the performances of he he can read a room, he can read a scene, he can read an audience and knows how to play it. So you want to be closer to him. And I that's I, I think that explains the savvy and and some of the choices and also in marketing some of the stuff. I mean, we don't have to get into it too deep too deeply, but he hasn't embarrassed himself, but he's definitely had a tough time in the public eye. The no last question. Few years. He went through a very difficult divorce. There have been child custody elements, and he um, has talked a lot about substance issues as a result of that. But even there, he has been able to talk about it in like an open enough way that people understand it. Like he's he's even handled that situation with with dexterity. So yeah, I agree. I think it's a it's a singular ability to read a room. Yeah, he feels a little bit more in the lineage of the Paul Newman, Jimmy Stewart kind of Sidney Poitier famous person where you might know uh, things about them if you mm-hmm. read the tabloids, but for the most part, we remember their work and we think about their work. And, I, and I, if I had to guess 30 years from now, that's probably how we'll understand him more than, say, Tom Cruise, who we understand probably more clearly as a celebrity and a movie star, right. but not as an actor really very much at all. And that's, that's uh, it's just worth noting, I think. Yeah, I, well, I, I think it's probably equal on Brad Pitt. I mean, it, Tom Cruise is an interesting comparison because he married Katie Holmes and did Tomcat pretty much at the same time as Brangelina became one of the giant couples of that era. And it, it's funny, Jennifer Lopez is also in there with Benifer about a that's couple right. years before. They really are very similar in a lot of ways. And it's hard to underestimate like what a big deal that was, especially... The, the Jennifer Aniston and the Angelina, that divorce and then Angelina swooping in and there's a whole movie about it, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, which is not on my list. Nor mine. I, I love fun, that movie, fun movie though. I actually, it's it's a great movie about marriage actually and the, those therapy scenes are fantastic, but it's, you know, it's kind of dialed in performances from both of them. But I think that all of his personal stuff or gossip stuff. We can't divorce it, but he has figured out a way to use it. And in both in movies like Jesse James and Once Upon a Time to Extent, and also how to navigate the exterior parts of it. Whereas I think someone like Tom Cruise got swallowed by it. I think there's also a little bit of a gender thing happening here. When we talked about Jennifer Lopez, we think of her not strictly and certainly not first as an actor. Mm -hmm. With Pitt, I think that we do. The same way we don't necessarily think of Elizabeth Taylor as an actor. We think of her as a celebrity who hawked perfume and ha- was married eight times. Yeah. And- Though in Jennifer Lopez's case, it's also because she is a TV star and she does have eight other, and she's also a musician and she has the perfume and the clothing line and all of those things. She is a business um, in a way that, which is, I th- has been very successful for her and is, I think, the way to be really famous right now for the most part. But, you know, it, it, that is different. It is different. What's number two for you? Uh, Inglourious Bastards. It's number two for me as well. I wonder if we have the same top two. Uh, that would be so nice if we did. We w- probably do. Wouldn't it be nice? I have a, a slash Once Upon a Time in Hollywood on okay. my number two. But, you know, I don't, I don't know if you and I have really had an Inglourious Bastards conversation. It's my favorite Tarantino, hands down. Okay, why? Um, well, I think some of it is just that it is more in line with my interests than, say, Reservoir Dogs, which is, you know, there are, like, women in it, and <laughs> it's it's set in Europe, and there are, it's about movies, and there are, like, historical elements as opposed to kind of the gritty. I like the old Hollywood Tarantino as opposed to, like, gritty crime Tarantino, if that makes any sense. Not that I don't like the gritty crime stuff, but it's just my interests. Um, Do you think that, okay, so... I don't know that I believe this take, and maybe this take belongs on the hottest take, but is there a case to be made that Brad Pitt is bad in this movie? Oh, do you want to make that? Well, well, it's because it is the one performance where, and part of it is because Tarantino, the tone of Tarantino films is very unusual, but he's making a big choice with the accent. He's got this big scar on his neck, Mm -hmm. and it's a bit of a ridiculous character, and in some ways he sticks out in the movie and in other ways he blends in. 
it feels very self-conscious and that doesn't mean I don't like it. I do like it. In fact, it's probably one of my favorite movies ever made. It is truly a wonderful movie. We just did a rewatchables yeah. about it. It's great. Brad is, it's very noticeable what Brad is doing and not in exactly in the movie star way. That's what I like about it. Okay. Rewatching it, the cadence and the voice stuck out to me as a, an achievement and also kind of unlocking like a thing that Brad Pitt does. The, he is a very physical actor. He obviously looks great on screens, but he can do voice work. And the the Aldo Rain voice is so central to this performance. And the reason that I know that it works is because I can hear it in my head right now. He created a whole like rhythm of talking. Gorlami. Yeah. And, you know, even just that, yeah, you know, I, like anyone can do it. And I hear other people referencing it all the time. He just created something that was like instantly classic. So I, I guess that is a little bit of the character actor thing. But I just think it's him trying a new mode of acting and it works and it's and it's funny. And I, and I don't need to interrogate it too much after that if, if it, it has such an influence and stays with you. I'm like, okay, this works. One of the things that I think has aged well about it is the fact that he has now done Once Upon a Time in Hollywood with Tarantino and used his beauty and his mm -hmm. charisma and movie stardom to obvious effect. And so now if you put these two movies together, you can kind of see that they're part of a package of Brad Pitt and Tarantino's vision of movie stardom. Number one... I, I assume is Moneyball yeah. for you. It has to be Moneyball. Good Lord is Moneyball a great movie. I rewatched it last night just as an excuse to rewatch it. And there is nothing that makes me happier than this movie. It is absolutely amazing. I, I can't believe we don't talk about it more. I know. I just want to watch it every day. You know, it was a very early rewatchables. I don't think either one of us was on it. No, I think that was just a Bill and a, Chris. A Bill and Chris Ryan affair. And... For, upon reflection, I'm quite mad that I was not asked to participate. It really is one of the best movies of, of the last 20 years, and it is almost entirely because of Brad Pitt. Yes. He's in almost every frame of the movie. All the performances are great. It's really well made by Bennett Miller. It's a great script. I love that book. I'm a huge baseball fan. There's a lot to love about the movie intellectually, emotionally, visually, etc. But holy shit, he's so good. And it's doing none of the things that we're really talking about here. Well, I think it's doing all of them. Is it? Because he's not really bending over backwards to impress you with anything. You know, it, there is a natural charm and intelligence and ease in the role. Right, which is, for me, what Once what Upon like a Time most. in Hollywood That's is about. True. That's true. I think that, and there is like that just natural charisma that he's relying on. He's reading the room. The The emotional intelligence is there. It's really physical, even though, I mean, both in the seeds of him working out, which are just hilarious to me, but also, you, you know, that scene, um, the, the first time that, Jonah Peter Brand is in the room mm -hmm. and there he's explaining the new Moneyball system to all the other scouts and it's like when I point at you yes I want to talk to you and then he leans over and is like you got to carry the one and even the way he takes the cap off the marker and just like blows it out it is it, it is like actually the physical presence of Brad Pitt that is selling all of that I think that it is both kind of reserved looking for connection, making sense of, you know, what all the father figures in his life promised to him, Brad Pitt, and also dickhead Brad Pitt, yes. where he is a little mean and a little aggressive and, and you know, fires people and throws stuff in the clubhouse. And I think he's both wearing terrible clothes and is like maybe the hottest he's ever been in a movie. So the gold chain, I don't even know what to do about that. So I, to me, it is the summation of all of, all of the Brad Pitt. And it is it's relaxed and anguished at the same time. And only he, like, who else is going to make that movie work? It's a it's a great point. It's very similar to Ad Astra in that way where it's sort of like, I don't even know if this movie happens if you don't have somebody who can do this work. And Billy Bean, the real life Billy Bean, who is, you know, it should be stated, this movie, the book is, um, I don't know, probably 15 years old. The season that they're tracking is 17 years old. Billy Bean still is the general manager of the Oakland A's. The Oakland A's are still hugely competitive despite having a significantly smaller payroll. They're probably going to the playoffs again this year. Like, the, the movie has aged beautifully in that mm -hmm. respect. It's still an active story. 
It's also been so useful for me to understand all other sports because Moneyball has sort of it filtered through all of them. It really has. It's a kind of a crash course yeah. in Ringer in so many ways. It's, it's, I appreciate you. Yeah, I, I, it, it works really, really well in that respect. It's also Pitt is such a credible ex-baseball player. Yeah. He has the swagger and the walk and the physicality that you're talking about. And when he's throwing that, you know, that water cooler... <laughs> You know, you, you it buy it. That's time. not the first time he's thrown a water cooler. You yeah. know what I mean? He's spent he's spent a lot of time in the last 30 years doing that. And at, at the same time, he's capturing something that the real Billy Bean couldn't capture. You know what I mean? As much as we have come to worship Billy Bean and the consciousness of somebody who helped change sports, really, and business maybe even for good, Pitt has something elevated and ephemeral that you can't put your finger on. And it's... It's just yeah. it's so great. I think also the way that he interacts with everyone in that movie. Especially Spike Jones, which is the it's, funniest I, that, fucking thing. Is, <laughs> I, as I said, I was watching it last night and my husband was like, eh, I'll just watch, you know, 10 minutes. And then he, it was like, oh, it should I go to in. bed now? Should I go to bed now? And uh, he like sucked tried, me in. He tried to go to bed before the Spike Jones scene. And I was like, you got to see Spike Jones. And he was like, yes, you're right. I do. Um <laughs> And that's just an amazing example of the reaction. Brad Pitt just sits there at the the cell phone thing and he's still and is just making that angry face and you know everything that you need to know. But the way he reacts to Jonah Hill, the his whole interaction with Philip Seymour Hoffman, all of the scouts, who I think many of them are real scouts and it's just him, you know, reading the room again, he... He really does react to people. I think that's like an underrated aspect of Brad Pitt. Um, and it's it's magic in this movie. The, the movie has a huge, really bad beat for Grady Fusen, the former scouting director yeah. for the A's. I got to say, returning to the movie, I was like, wow, they really shit on this guy. <laughs> um, it's just an absolutely wonderful movie. If you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend it. Let's just do a speed round of honorable mentions. Okay. Um, this guy's made a lot of good movies. Yeah. And we've hardly talked about two thirds of them. Um, you know, I think one of the interesting things he's done along along with movies like Ad Astra is you very quietly and with with calm measure place himself in movies like Twelve Years a Slave. So I think, and I think Zach actually wrote this in mm -hmm. his piece so that he can appear briefly in the trailer for the film. But then that is what allows a movie like Twelve Years a Slave to get made. He has this fascinating career just as a producer, right? which is impressive. And he still gives good performance in the performances in those roles. But, you know, True Romance, also a rewatchables, Floyd, the stoner, is yeah. just hilarious and perfect. And I get the impression that that's one of the few things in True Romance that Tarantino thinks is perfect because <laughs> he didn't direct that movie even though he wrote that script. And you can see why he keeps returning to him again and again. I'd be remiss if I didn't just say that his role in the Tree of Life is also in this <laughs> co continuum of dads and sons yes. and his fucked up relationship to them or what seems like a fucked up relationship. Yeah. I That one's just a little too buttoned up for me. Okay. That's like, it, I mean, I know, I'm sorry. Terrence Malick's really important and I respect Terrence Malick and I respect But him sitting in his chair and making him listen to his records, you know, that's yeah, some, that's some no, real I shit. Yeah, no, I know that's like, a, I know that's real. Okay. I know that's an important scene, but I just think that it's a it's a slightly too strict version of Brad Pitt. Okay. What, what, what would you put on your honorable mentions? So I, as I said, I put Benjamin Button on there just yeah. for the power of his face. Sure. I can't believe you didn't put Fight Club on there. Yeah, it's on my. It's on here. It's yeah. on honorable mention. Yeah, like I said, I just think it's the turning point. It's when dickhead Brad Pitt comes out, and he's I, very important. I think I have to have some level of self awareness of okay. self parody about being about overstating my interest in Fight Club. Okay. You know, as, especially as I get older. Great. I, I, I like I it a lot. You. I think Tyler Durden is not a hard role for him. Yeah, that's the thing. Is I think that that's easy for him to do. It doesn't really seem like he's stretching himself. Right. And it's very showy. I think Ed, Nor the Ed Norton performance is the performance in the movie. That's the one where, and Helena Bonham Carter too, for, to be honest. But Brad, that's just Brad Pitt's natural power. Is mm -hmm. He's like, I don't have my shirt on. Yeah. I look amazing and I'm being a dick. Yeah. And it, it's great. Well, but it's important to honor that. That's a, that's a central aspect of the Brad Pitt experience. Um, I was going to be cute and put the, the Friends cameo. On this, I list. don't even remember that he was on Friends when he was married to Jennifer Aniston, and I, oh, it's yeah. then I put Burn After Reading on instead because actually Burn After Reading is his best comedic performance. But <sighs> yeah, Gwyneth Paltrow to Jennifer Aniston to Angelina Jolie is just you know. extraordinary. Yes, I, is there any precedent? 
No, is there any precedent to Brad Pitt? No, there's not. not. Totally. There's not. 